Welcome to lecture one of module nine. We're getting into dynamics and quantum mechanics. We're going to be talking about time evolution. I'm going to introduce you to the Trotter formula and the time ordered product. So we've been focusing primarily on eigenstates so far in this class, and now we want to talk about how those quantum states change with time. So we just define an operator that does that. We start at some time t0, and we define what we call the time evolution operator, which is going to be u hat of t comma t0 to be the operator that takes me from a wave function psi at t0 to the wave function psi at time t, and that's expressed for you in the equation below. Now notice this operator works for any wave function psi of t. So it's not an operator that is specific to psi. There's no psi subscript for this u operator. So it's a general operator that will take a quantum state and map it at one time and map it to the quantum state at a later time. Notice this acts just the way operators act. It takes a vector in our state space and maps it to another vector in our state space. Thinking about how this works, where we have one operator that does the time evolution for everything, sounds like it might be a very complicated operator, but we're going to see it's really not so bad. So the time evolution operator has to satisfy the following conditions. And the first thing that it has to satisfy is unitarity. So the initial state psi of t0 is normalized. And because probability is conserved, it's got to remain normalized for all time. So that means the bra ket psi of t psi of t must equal, which is equal to the bra ket bra psi of t0, u dagger of t comma t0, u of t comma t0, ket psi of t0. That has to equal 1. Now note the bra ket psi of t0 psi of t0 is equal to 1. So if u dagger times u is equal to 1, that will guarantee that the norm of this state is preserved. And indeed, if this is a unitary operator, it actually guarantees that all inner products will be preserved between any two states. So we're going to require this operator to be a unitary operator. Now, if you remember, unitary operators can be expressed as exponentials of i times Hermitian operators, and we'll get into that in just a moment. The second thing that it has to satisfy is something called the semigroup property. And this just uses the fact that time evolution is additive. And additive is meant in the following way. If I evolve directly from t0 to t, that's the same as evolving from t0 to some intermediate time t prime and then to t. And that means u of t comma t0 must equal u of t comma t prime, u of t prime comma t0. That right-hand side says, starting from the right-hand side, I start at time t0, evolve to time t prime, and then I evolve from time t prime to time t. Obviously, this has to hold for any kind of time evolution operator. Otherwise, it's not describing time evolution because time evolution satisfies this additive property. So as I had mentioned before, the exponential of a Hermitian operator, of i times a Hermitian operator, is a unitary operator. And if that Hermitian operator depends on time in a linear fashion, as we've shown here, that will satisfy these two, these two conditions. Now, it's not the only way that I can satisfy those two conditions. And I'm going to actually modify it slightly in just a moment, because we recognize that this operator O might also change with time. So we have to be very careful. And we want to do this for small time intervals. Now, what operator is it that we're going to be putting in? Well, here is where we're going to have to put in a postulate and say that it's the Hamiltonian operator that governs the time evolution. This is motivated by the fact that the energy is governing time evolution in the classical world. So the Hamiltonian, or if you have taken the advanced classical mechanics, you learn the Hamiltonian governs time evolution in the classical world. And we're going to just elevate that to also governing the time evolution in the quantum world. So what we're going to postulate, and we're working with an infinitesimal time evolution, because from that we can get all time evolutions. 
from that semigroup rule, we're going to postulate that this infinitesimal time evolution operator for a Hamiltonian, I wrote constant Hamiltonian, but then I went in and I changed the equation. This actually will work for a time dependent Hamiltonian. And I'm gonna carefully explain what I mean by that. So this infinitesimal operator that carries me from time t to time t plus delta t, I want it to be linear in the time interval. That's why it has a delta t in the exponent. It has to depend on the Hamiltonian operator h. Dimensions tell me that I have to divide by an h bar. I need an i there because the h is Hermitian for this to be a unitary operator. So essentially everything is just sort of governed by these requirements that we've given so far. That Hamiltonian operator is being evaluated as a constant Hamiltonian with the time corresponding to the time in the middle of that time interval. So it's halfway between the time t and the time t plus delta t. And then finally, we have this minus sign. Well, that minus sign is actually just chosen by convention. All of the properties will be satisfied with a plus sign as opposed to a minus sign. But when we choose the minus sign, it does the nice thing such that a plane wave or a free particle with momentum p actually moves in the positive direction like we would like it to. If we pick the opposite sign, if we pick the plus sign, that free particle would actually move in the direction of minus p, and that would just be inconvenient. It's not that we couldn't organize our theory that way, it just would be very confusing and very inconvenient. So we pick the minus sign by convention, and then this will agree with everything that you've done in classical mechanics when you've looked at things like harmonic oscillators, oscillating as a function of time, and so forth. All right, so. When we want to do a long time evolution, we just have to put together all of these different factors. So I started at time t0, and I went to time t. So I have this chain of factors, u of t0 plus delta t comma t0, u of t0 plus 2 delta t comma t0 plus delta t, all the way up to u of t comma t minus delta t. Okay. Now we just postulated what each of those factors are. They're going to be e to the minus i h times delta t divided by h bar. If h is a constant Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is the same for every one of those. So I get a delta t for every one of those factors, and I can just add up all those delta t factors, and I'm going to get t minus t0. Because I can put all of the exponents, if you think in terms of bch, because the Hamiltonian commutes with itself because it's time independent, I can put all of those exponents into the same exponential, and there's no correction term because everything commutes. So I can just accumulate everything into the same exponential term. And then we find that this u of t comma t0 is e to the minus i h hat multiplied by the number t minus t0, that's not the argument of h, divided by h bar. And I really want to make sure you pause and be sure that you understand this formula. It's a really important formula to understand for how we get this simplification of the time evolution operator in the case where the Hamiltonian is constant and not changing as a function of time. Now, what if it is changing as a function of time? So back in the 1940s, this gentleman on the right, Trotter, came up with a way to express this, and we've written it down already. We just put together those infinitesimal products starting on the right with u of t0 plus delta t comma t0 running all the way up to u of t comma t minus delta t. Now we worked out the formula for each what happens with each of those small steps. That's the infinitesimal time evolution and we assume that the Hamiltonian is approximately constant. We evaluate the Hamiltonian at the midpoint of each of those intervals and we just substitute into the Trotter product formula. Now what you see is this is a set of products. I can no longer put everything into the same exponent because h of t does not necessarily commute with h of t prime. There are some time-dependent Hamiltonians where it does commute, and in that case, you could put them all together, and then that object would, would look like an integral of the Hamiltonian with respect to time. But 
in general, they do not commute. And in nearly all quantum problems that have time dependence, they do not commute with each other, in which case you need to leave them in this, what's called a time-ordered product. And that name should just be obvious because we're taking each of these factors and we're putting them in a time order. You just need to remember as a nice mnemonic that the late times are to the left. So you have an L in both of those words, late times to the left. All right, we're now going to discuss the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. The Trotter formula becomes more and more accurate as we take the limit delta t goes to zero. Actually, taking that limit of delta t goes to zero might start to make your head swim because you have all these exponential factors and it's hard to see exactly how does that work. So the way that we sort that out is we actually find an equation of motion for this time evolution operator. So we're going to look at the derivative of the time evolution operator with respect to t. And we're just going to define it the way derivatives are defined. We're going to take the limit, delta t goes to 0, u of t plus delta t comma t0 minus u of t comma t0 divided by delta t. Now look at that u of t plus delta t comma t0. I can write that as that factor, u of t plus delta t comma t multiplied by u of t comma t0. And then that factor, u of t plus delta t comma t, that just is written in terms of our infinitesimal form, e to the minus i h of t plus delta t over 2, multiplied by delta t divided by h bar, and then I get a minus 1 because there's just a 1 in, in front of the second term. That is something that I can easily expand the exponential. The exponential will be 1 plus its exponent plus higher order terms. The 1s will cancel, so I'm just left with the exponent. And now I'm going to do some rearranging. I'm going to bring the I'm going to multiply by i h bar on both sides. And you can see the delta t's cancel. And then when I take the limit, delta t goes to 0, I'm going to evaluate the Hamiltonian at time t. And lo and behold, we we've derived the differential equation. i h bar d by dt of u of t comma t0 is h of t times u of t comma t0. And one way that you can think about this is, all of the time dependence is sitting in that leftmost factor from the Trotter formula. So when I take the derivative with respect to time, I just take the derivative of that term, but the derivative of an exponential is just the exponent. So I just pull down the Hamiltonian at that time. Now you also have to recall that even though this looks like something that I can easily integrate, I cannot because the Hamiltonian does not commute with itself at, at different times. So I cannot just integrate that and write it as an exponential of an integral of h of t. It only integrates in this time-ordered product, which we explicitly constructed, which is the formula sitting at the top of the page. Now, to get to the Schrodinger equation, we have to remember that we defined the state psi of t as u of t comma t0 psi of t0. And if we just multiply on the left by psi of t0 on both sides and then re-express u of t comma t0 psi of t0 is psi of t, you see we get the equation, the differential equation at the bottom, which is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. i h bar d by dt psi of t equals h of t psi of t. Okay? So we've now derived that time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So just as a summary here, that first equation is called the equation of motion for the time evolution operator, and the second equation is called the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This is all we need to determine how quantum states evolve as a function of time and how they change as a function of time. And we're going to be going through some examples in the next couple of lectures. But I want to go through one example with you right now. So let's look at how we compute the time evolution when we have a time-independent Hamiltonian. So let's first focus on uh, some notation, we're going to call the energy eigenstates uh, ket n, n is the label, the energy eigenvalue is en, so we have eigenstates where h acting on the state n is equal to en times the state n, you see that's an eigenvector, eigenvalue, eigenvector relationship. And we're going to consider a general state, which is a superposition 
of these states. So psi of zero is gonna be a sum over n, cn times n. Now I want to be very careful to point out when I take a linear combination of energy eigenstates, I am no longer in an energy eigenstate. If I operate the Hamiltonian on that state psi of zero, it doesn't give a number times psi of zero because the energies are embedded inside that sum and I cannot pull them out because the energy eigenvalues are different for the different states. This is something that people often get confused by. When I take a linear superposition of energy eigenstates, that does not mean that I have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It only remains an energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian if the states that I'm taking the linear combination with respect to are states that all have the same energy, then I can factor that energy out. All right, so we have our time evolution operator. It's a constant Hamiltonian. We know exactly what it is. So we can just go ahead and plug it in. We get psi of t is equal to u of t comma zero, psi of zero. I picked zero just because it makes the formulas a little bit easier rather than picking a t zero. Now we substitute in what that u operator is. It's e to the minus i h operator times t number divided by h bar acting on psi of zero. To figure out how it acts, I only know what happens when h acts on eigenstates. So let me do the expansion of psi in terms of those eigenstates. I can move that operator into the sum, and then if I move it next to the state, because I can commute it with the number cn, you see it's going to operate against the state, and then the h gets replaced by an en. So I find psi of t is just the sum over n c n e to the minus i e n t over h bar times n. So we can summarize time evolution in a time-independent Hamiltonian in a very easy fashion. All we do is we figure out the linear superposition in terms of the eigenstates, and then we just shift the eigenstate coefficients. c n goes to c n e to the minus i e n t over h bar, and that's it. Now I do want you to recognize that because the time evolution of those coefficients is different for each n, because the ENs are different for each n, that linear superposition is changing the state as time evolves. And so it actually is a very complicated time evolution. We're gonna see an explicit concrete example of that next. All right, so let's look at a concrete example, the particle in a box. Let's recall we're working in an infinite box that is ranging from zero is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to l and recall the solutions. The wave functions are sines. So psi n of x is the square root of two over l. That's the normalization factor. Sine of n pi x over l, where n is an integer ranging from one to infinity. E n is equal to h bar squared pi squared n squared over two m l squared. And we're going to consider just a very simple superposition. We're going to consider a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state. So we're going to look at psi 1 of x plus psi 2 of x, and we're going to take just the even linear superposition, 1 over square root of 2 times both of those. Let's go ahead and evaluate what the time evolved state is. We, we worked it out on the previous page. We just have to take those coefficients, multiply the first one by e to the minus i, e1 t over h bar, and the second one by e to the minus i e2 t over h bar. Now I just want you to look at the energies and recognize that e2 is four times e1. Because the energies go like n squared, e2 is four times e1. And to get rid of the h bars, I'm gonna write e1 over h bar as omega one. So omega one is equal to h bar pi squared over two m l squared. All right, so we're gonna first factor out one factor, e to the minus i e, uh, e one t over h bar. That's a complex phase, it's not gonna affect anything. And then I get the difference of the energy eigenvalues as modifying the coefficient of the second term in the superposition. And that's a general result. It's actually the energy differences that govern the time evolution, not the energies themselves. So we're now gonna replace this with the frequency and because that energy difference is three times omega one, the time evolution is going like three times omega one. Let's take a look at what this looks like because you really need to visualize this. So I took this animation from the Wikipedia page on time evolution and what you can see is you have this sloshing motion. 
it's kind of like a particle bouncing back and forth between the walls. Remember, it's a one-dimensional motion. And this is a plot of the probability distribution, the psi squared as a function of time. And you can see that clearly looks like something that's moving. It's sloshing back and forth inside this box, and the probability is changing. It's not exactly what you might expect with a classical motion. It doesn't seem to get all that close to the walls as it sloshes back and forth. But you have this kind of motion that you get for the quantum state that is derived from this dependence that we get when we apply the time evolution operator onto a superposition. Okay, And we're going to have the chance to explore more of these as we go further in the class in studying time evolution. That now takes us to the end of lecture one of module nine.